Welcome to this special episode of the DOT POD. I'm Josh Heller. And I'm Anya Cardos. It's been 23 years since the harrowing events of 9-11, a day that's become one of remembrance and an expression of national unity. As we mark this somber anniversary, we travel down to the September 11th Memorial and Museum to share the perspective of two New York State Department of Transportation employees one of whom was working near the World Trade Center, who found himself at the epicenter of one of history's most devastating attacks. Join us as they recount what they witnessed and how NYSDOT employees played a critical role during a time of crisis and in helping New York City recover from a tragedy that forever changed America. My name is Mukesh Desai. I was engineer in charge for New York State DOT for reconstruction contract segment 2, Route 9A, West Street, from Battery Place to Chamber Street. That it was a normal day for our regular construction. Segment 2 was like a 99% complete. And we were just doing landscaping that day. And we were planning for the final inspection by the city agencies that day. And we were supposed to meet city agency around 10. So we were preparing to go out, you know, and we got the call from our field inspector on the walkie-talkie at that time, not a call, you know, and she said that something happened to World Trade Center number one and smokes are coming out. And she was inspecting landscaping work right across World Trade Center number one. But she was at the ground level, so she cannot see what's happening and when I turn around my head from my office because and look at it World Trade Center things were flying from the World Trade Center you know and so I just talked to resident engineer Albert Posotrigo I said we are going out anyway let's go and see what's going on and I just thought that let me call my wife so I called my wife I said, something happened to World Trade Center. Turn on the TV and see what's going on. We don't know what's going on. And we left from our 39 Broadway office and we were walking. That's the south side of the World Trade Center site. So we crossed the West Side Highway and we were walking on the bikeway from West Ham Street to Albany Street. While we were walking, second plane came from the south side, just pass over our head, and as you turn your head, it disappeared into number two World Trade Center building. We all got so scared, we started running, you know, away from the World Trade Center. We run a little bit further south, and that's waiting. And then we thought that World Trade Center buildings is made to design to take this type of force and all that thing, so we don't have to worry about it. Let's go closer and see. So we all, Albert Posadrigo, Ray Woodfield, Linda Hunan, and me, walk up to Albany Street. And we were waiting at the southwest corner of the Albany Street and West Side Highway and watching these two buildings. And Albert Posadrigo said, Mukes, this building is tilting. It may collapse. I say, Albert, if it's building gonna collapse, where we are waiting is not safe. We just, I finished the sentence. I just, and whole building came down. And we turn around. All four people went in different direction. And I was l- running towards Battery Park City and then towards the Rector Street. I may have walked like a, not like a hundred feet and you see the all stone aggregates were falling in front of you. And then within a few seconds, I was covered with the dust from head to toe. Completely everything was covered under the, and I could not see anything. So I started, but I was keep shouting, help, help, help. And there was a, you know, bellboy or whatever in the rector place in a building. 
he came out and he grabbed me my collar and pulled me inside. And I, I could not see anything. I just asked him, take me somewhere where I can wash my eyes so I can see what's going on. And he took me to the janitor's, you know, closet type thing. And, you know, I just washed my eyes, cleaned myself a little bit, you know. And just I'd remove my shirt and just clean with every, whatever I could, you know. And then I came out and just looking for the window and number one building came down. I was inside the building when the number one came down. And dust was going up like a, at least few story up. At that time, like it was a sunny, nice day, but it covers like a, with the snow and clouds completely. You don't see anything from the even window. And still I was in the building and emergency vehicle coming. You can see everything from the, and they, whenever the emergency vehicle pass, you, dust goes up and that settle down. And I said, what can we do now? How are we gonna get out from here now? And I had to look for the, my colleagues, you know. So uh, phone was not working, you know, so I could not call them up or anything. And I started, got out of the building. I had my hard hat and waist, so people let me go around it basically. And I was looking for Albert, Ray, and Linda. And I just walked like a maybe, block or two. So, I mean, I found Albert first and I found the Ray Woodfield second. And I said, we cannot wait here. So I said, they were saying that you go up to Joey's museum and wait over there. There was NYPD police were there already. So we started walking towards the Joey's museum, which is south side of the Walter Center side, and we went up to the Jewish Museum, and I was kept trying to call my supervisor Manny Silva, and I said my wife both you know was trying to reach one of them you know basically, and then I my phone connected to Manny, so I said Manny, we I this is what I'm going on, but I cannot find Linda, Linda is not missing you know, and he was. And then I was just, while I was on the phone, I remember that day, Linda was with the, all over the dust and coming towards the Jewish Museum. I said, I found Linda. I was so happy to see Linda's face that Linda is coming. And I said, Linda is okay too. So we all are good, at least four of us are good, you know. And then we were just waiting at the Jewish Museum over there. And they said, you know, they will, then NYPD came and they said, you have to get in the boat and we're gonna take you to the New Jersey uh, Science Liberty Science Museum area. And over there you will have uh, all the facility for the medical treatment and, all, and transportation and everything. And they took us over there that day, you know. So that's my you know, side of the 9-11. Pukesh, how long did it take you to, you know, from when you when you got there to to actually get home that day? I mean, that, that had to, that just, I, mean, I can't imagine what that process was like. I mean, I think maybe around noontime we were at the Science Museum and we thought that they would provide the transportation or something. So we waited, waited, but there was nothing. So I asked this guy, that I'm familiar with the New Jersey, Jersey City. If we walk, we can go up to my brother's store he is at the Jersey Avenue Norman Pharmacy, and we can borrow his car, and I can take you home. We walk up to my brother's store, and he was not there. Store was closed, and at that time it may be almost two. So we said that let's eat something, and then we'll worry, figure it out how to go. And I just we just went across the street and had a pizza. And that time they had a TV, but very, you know, blurry pictures was coming. At that time around 2, 2.30, we knew what happened and what's happening. We didn't know anything. All say, that, was, that was another question. When did, I mean, you saw obviously the, you know, the, the second plane, but I didn't know what was going on. No, no, we have no idea. The remaining two planes were there. We heard little bit about the one plane was knocked down in Pennsylvania. One was hitting the Pen Pentagon. All that thing we heard around 233, 
at the the pizzeria, and after the pizza, I said we we don't have any choice but we can go up to Jersey City General Square area, which is a public transportation hub type thing, and we may get something from there. And there are thousands of people walking on New Jersey side also. So many people were walking, so after that we walk up to the uh, General Square. And General Square, they said they're going to put a train, part train, one at a time. You cannot go inside because so many people are waiting. They just let enough people to get in the building. And one train at a time, they take you up to Newark Penn Station. And Newark Penn Station is the same situation. You wait, and they said they will put a New Jersey Transit train, and they will announce which, you know, like is it a... Northeast corridor, or the, is it a coastal line, or is it going to, you know, Raritan line or something? And that's the only people go up and then get the train. And I think I was home around seven thirty that day. I mean, but with all, you know, there are often attacks across the country against people, and they are horrific. But this one was horrifyingly unique in that. The entire country was literally watching some of this on TV unfold in front of their very eyes. You didn't have that benefit until you and your colleagues had lunch at a pizza parlor, right? And yeah. you were watching it on TV. When you understand the the the, the entire scope of what was going on, what, what was your reaction? It, it was so scary and you know so you know that if you were like as after watching this thing, we were. We thought and we were discussing among ourselves that we are so lucky that we survive. We were so lucky. I mean, we could not believe it. And we have no idea how many people got hurt or killed. But we were you know, talking among ourselves that we were so lucky. At this time, we're going to bring in Craig Rule. He is a- another now retired NISDOT employee who at the time of 9-11 was working also as an engineer in charge on the 9A project, but on a separate segment. Craig, tell us where you were and what was going on in that day. Um, That day, I actually wasn't here. I was off. Um, I had an aunt who had passed away in Illinois, and I was at the funeral that day. And, and, you know, it it was really hard because we knew me, my family, who was from here, we knew what was going on. We saw that on the TV in the hotel in, in the morning. And I spent the whole day bouncing off the walls trying to, you know, what's going on? How are my friends? You know, Mukesh and all of his staff who were down here. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot of worry of what was happening down here. And, you know, why am I not there? You come back and you realize the scope of recovery efforts and what's going on. Can you talk about how that connected to all of the work that NISDOT does in the city and and what you guys had to do to roll up your sleeves and and join in this effort? Like next day, or I think next day we just came with a group of people with my supervisor and they said meet at the 34th street and we walk from 34th street to all the way up to the battery place and around the whole World Trade Center side. And at that time, they were considering as a recovery efforts, I think. They were not considering. And I mean, we got the call that emergency management center wants us to provide the utility drawings as built utility drawings. And our office at the 39 Broadway, 11th floor, didn't have electricity. So we walked on the staircase, went up with the flashlight. We got our S-built drawing, got up to the, I think, Pier 96, where the emergency management center, they opened up. And we brought all the drawing. They made a copy of it, and they asked us, first thing, to locate the valve for the all-water main and turn it off. They provided DEP people to work with us, but it was almost impossible to find any reference point. We have the reference point from the curb or the intersection or something, but you can't find the curb, you cannot find the... But we, with the DEP and with our you know, personal knowledge, 
Linda and all, we work and we turn it off water. I, within a day or two, I'm not sure which day, but within a day or two. And then they asked us, second thing was to see where we can provide the power and the communication line from Verizon building, which is right at the VZ and the West Street, and Conned power going, because Conned and Verizon brings all that thing to the Wall Street, and that goes through the West Side Highway, to the Rector Street, to the Broadway, and then to the Wall Street. So they ask us possibility of providing all these things and help them to provide the temporary electrical feed and the communication. So we work with the people to provide that, you know, in an, you know, first few days. As you said, there was no reference point anymore for where the streets had been, where the curbs had been. What did you provide to emergency management so they could locate these fiber optics or where all the water was supposed to be going, water mains, things like that? What did you provide specifically? Uh, we, we provide specifically the existing drawing, which was as built drawing, where it was built so they can use the existing one. And for temporary, they have to run on the street temporary. So, I mean, that's, you know, completely, you know, some of the area was clear for on the bikeway path up to Chamber Street and that was going into battery place. And then they bring it back up to the West Ham Street and brought back on the Rector Street and connected to the Wall Street. So basically you, ha you had to show emergency management where everything was underneath the street yeah, yeah. and and how to connect to water mains and things yeah. like that. That so was more like a coordination. They were doing utility company and the emergency people were doing it, but we were just coordinating and helping them. This is the best way to bring you something. I came back a week later and I remember I took the train into the city. I always took the train into the city. I wasn't gonna drive into Manhattan even on a good day. Uh, and I remember walking from the subway station to my office on Pier 40 along Houston Street. The thing that struck me was the smell. Even about a half mile away, everything just smelled burnt. Um, and then I got down to my office, got into my office, and, and a little while later, I got a call from the region, and they said, we've got a list of things that we need you to do. Craig, you're mentioning... A, a list of things that that they were looking for you guys to do. I, I don't even know how you triage something like that. But talk about what uh, you know what they were looking for or from DOT to uh, you know to start these these recovery efforts. The the first thing that they asked us to do is they wanted to fence off areas of the World Financial Center and uh, different areas around the World Trade Center site. Uh, so that's what we started doing. We had a fence contractor as part of our, our, our project, and we brought him down there and went down there with the, the DDC emergency management people and put a fence here, put a fence here, put some fence there. And that was the, the first few days. In the weeks after and the months after, there was an effort to remove debris from the World Trade Center site. How did you help out Craig and Mukesh and, and DOT in, in making that happen as well. The one location where they could get barges close enough to the land was just south of Pier 25. Um, so, so the first Which is thing, the north of Chamber Street, between Chamber and the, you know... And where, Harrison Street. Harrison Street. And these would the be to take, to take yeah, debris side. away. Yeah, that's right. 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 So the first thing they had to do was they had to bring in dredges to dredge it out because no boat had been in that area in a really long time. So they dredged the whole thing out in a couple of days and then they started bringing barges in. And then uh, what we did, what the department did was we built an area for them to bring the steel beam. This was where they were going to unload. At first, it was just the steel they were going to bring it up, unload it onto a, they had a big sort of bucket that was on a, a, attached to a crane that was on the barge, and that would take it onto the barge, and then uh, they would take it to Staten Island. Um, 
I remember we met with the DDC and what they wanted to do was just, they wanted to rip out all of the stuff that we had. We were, yeah, M Mukesh's project was probably about two weeks from being done when this happened. And mine was, would have been done at the end of the year. So maybe three months. And they just wanted to, and I understand that they wanted to just make this place so they could get everything out, but they gave us a day to figure it out, you know, so we could try to preserve as much as what we just finished building as possible. So myself and Roger Weld, who was from our design group, sat in the office with a laptop with uh, a CAD program on it and worked out all the turning radiuses and figured out how to get the trucks in, coming up one side of 9A, dump off the stuff, and then go back out on the other side and back down. This was a monumental effort. When you look back at that time, what are your thoughts about doing this? Typically projects take, you know, months, if not years, but this was all done in record time, really. What do you think about this championing this, this huge effort here? Well, for, for you can do a lot quick when you have to. Um, we got approval for things to, to, to build things, things that would, approvals that would take us months, we got in a phone call. Yeah. Um, and, and other thing is, which is already built and we were destroying it or removing it or that was not a thought at that time. We want to help and we want to get something done basically. So it was not a, how we're going to reconstruct that area. What will happen to that area was not an issue, basically. They said, just do it. it was and just we, we did it, basically, with our contractor help and everybody. Even contractors has worked without asking how we're going to get compensated, and they started working. Do you feel like this brought all these different agencies and different people together in a way that you'd never seen before? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I would, we, we also, I mean, we figured out how to do things and, and kind of get around restrictions that were, were put in. When we built this whole road, this uh, debris removal area, at first they didn't want us to pave it because they just wanted it done. Then after a couple of weeks with all the dust that was coming up, all right, we got to put some asphalt down on this. All right. So... We figured out where we were going to get the asphalt, and I said, well, how do we get permission to bring it down here? He said, well, you got to put a request together and send it up to this general in Albany, and he's got to send it to somebody else. And I said, all right, how about I just call the guy who runs the Holland Tunnel and ask him? And so I called him up, and he said, yeah, just give me the license plate numbers of the trucks, and we'll let him through. I mean, you would never see anything like that now but that this was such an unprecedented time things needed to be done and you guys got it done i mean after debris removal was going with our co cooperation everybody was going very well and we never expected that debris removal will be done that quick and by the december on the west side debris was pretty good removed and they agreed to give us a 76 or 78 foot of right of way so we can build a temporary roadway and they said uh, so we didn't have any plan or anything and but you know stantec draw some sketches and we started working in the like a january that winter was mild winter and we continue working 24 seven and we finished the, by March end, we finished three lane inch direction. And that was like, they wanted to do it with a battery park under, I mean, Brooklyn battery tunnel opening, same time. So, and everything was done with a, like a quick change order was prepared and change order was like a like it's like almost promised that you will get paid you know and the contractor was working 24 7 to finish that and that was a one of the bigger milestone as a new york state duty we you know they did like in three months time or less than three months time to open that three lane -ish direction being here at the 9 11 memorial and museum it's such a solemn place and it is such a place of 
connection to something so terrible. But I'm curious what it's like for you to come here, both of you, and to look at the exhibits and be here among folks who were also touched by this horrible event in our country's history. For me, I used to come every day from New Jersey. As soon as I get on Pulaski Skyway, I can see the two World Trade Center, you know, buildings. I know where I'm going to work. And now, when everything was gone, right now I can see the that foundation of that buildings, basically. Right now we are sitting at the foundation level of the building. You can see the columns of the building only. You cannot see anything else. It's something, you know. Is it hard for you to come back here? It's, I mean, now it's okay, but beginning it was very hard. I, and the first few days was so hard to, like, you don't feel like coming here, you know. That's a, that bad it was. Craig, what is it like for you to to come to this place? It brings back a lot of memories. Um, so it kind of brought, I guess, the rest of the world a little bit closer. Um, and some of the things, some of my memories, the things that stick out with me are whenever you would walk down here, there would be these little memorials that people would put pictures of people who were missing or they would stick teddy bears with notes on them. And those are the things that I remember. Um, there was a, a sign that they hung up on a fence right across the street from my office that came from a bunch of school kids in California. You know, that was, that was nice. I remember the first anniversary going up to the basement over here and they have the 9-11 memorial and I see the kids like a four or five years old kid was crying and I can, I can cry, you know, I mean, how do you explain the kids that your father or the mother went to walk and they are not coming? So that was a first year was a very hard, you know, when I see the real family member coming over here and crying. With the natural passing of time, memories fade, new generations are born, and they don't have these same experiences and they don't have these same memories. What would you like to share with this generation and generations to come about how we should and how we need to remember what happened? I would just say that never forget. You know, this is something that we always have to remember. It, and it's going to be one of those things like Pearl Harbor that everyone is always going to remember. It's main thing is how it happened and it should not happen to anybody. That's the main thing, you know. But, I mean, it's very, very, you know, shocking that somebody can do something like that bad to just human being another human being. You know, we had a chance to, to speak with a curator for the museum where we are currently. Uh, let's take a listen to, uh, to what she had to say about uh, where we are sitting today at the 9-11 Museum. My name is Jan Ramirez. Um, I'm the chief curator and uh, head of collections at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. I started on this project in 2006, which is when the sort of green light went on to develop a museum component to the outdoor memorial. Something that struck me as a longtime curator of material, what they call material culture, is the power of this underground space itself as an artifact. It, <clears throat> it really is, uh, some would see it as the sort of skeletal vestiges of the World Trade Center site. Um, and for us as museum uh, developers, it was, you know, uh, honestly a reliquary. And our job was to respect its aura, or, you know, re respect the, the physicality of the site. And then, like a relic, reliquary, return artifacts or relics from the World Trade Center to the site. So it's a very, very powerful witness experience. And I think for our visitors, the first thing they will take in, whether they were familiar with the World Trade Center or never saw it, was the scale, uh, the kind of enormity of physical loss, 
And that will help prepare them for the story that we really focus on in the 9-11 Museum, which is, you know, the the events of 9-11 through the lens of each and every intimate human being, you know, ca- caught in this uh, uh, vortex that day. And then what we did about it. I want, if, if you would, Jan, to, to take a second, talk about, especially since you, you know, basically were from, from the beginning of this, talk about the responsibility, uh, you know, of of designing something like this, of 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 going through with something like this, something that is going to be so so meaningful and and you know so it, it, so important, really. I mean that that has to be a, a a lot of responsibility on on you and on on everyone to make sure that that you get this right. Uh, well, I'm not sure if we did get it right. <laughs> we we did our best. Um, I think for our team, um, you know, the sense was whatever we did was going to be the first draft of the public history of 9-11 at this site. And so that was indeed a pretty intimidating responsibility. Um, one thing we needed to do was to always remember um, that it was not in any way the usual uh, way a new exhibition or, or a new museum is developed, which is sort of a, you know, if you will, a neutral space, a black box or white box. This was, you know, sacred ground it, for many families um, and responders. It's considered an unplanned cemetery. It's the last place a loved one or a colleague, you know, breathe, breathe, the, breathe their last. Um, I think that uh, special sort of sacrosanct nature of the site, uh, we might not have understood it in the beginning for the influence it would have, but it became the most important sort of moral barometer for what we were able to do and what we um, held back from doing in the museum site. Can you talk a little bit about what, you will see when you're there for those who haven't been there? Uh, For visitors um, coming to the museum, um, it's somewhat counterintuitive. You're not going up, you're going down. Uh, You're physically moving down a ramp to bedrock, what we call bedrock, which is seven stories below ground. It's the last uh, vestige of um, human engineering, where human engineering um, for the for the original towers of World Trade Center met Mother Nature, the schist stone, you know, beneath uh, at the at, at the base of uh, Lower Manhattan. And as you come down, you are actually occupying within this vast cavern uh, the two uh, sort of ghost volumes of the of the Twin Towers above you and you'll you'll know where they were because there are uh, the sort of engineering um, boxes for the two pools which thrust down like giant stalactites into the space um, one acre in size each and then under each of the of the so-called we call them footprints uh, there are different exhibition spaces uh, on the North Tower is where we explore the historical events of the day and their consequences in, in, in a large exhibition. And on the South Tower uh, volume, um, we have an exhibition honoring each and every lived life that was lost that day, as well as um, sort of a, a more tribute feel to art and um all the kind of gen- generous <clears throat> public responses that flowed into the United States, that flowed into the city of New York, that flowed to families and responder groups, and we you know, rotate that kind of material there. Um, visitors don't have to go into um, either of these footprint spaces to still get and uh, feel the experience of the site because the main sort of um, – we call it Foundation Hall, uh, sort of cavern of the of the site, which is vast. It's sort of like a um, low ground cathedral. Uh, holds the what we call the last column, which is the last piece of steel that was ceremoniously um, removed uh, from the World Trade Center site in uh, late May of two thousand 
uh, too. And you'll see a, a swath of the original slurry wall. That was a vestige of how the towers were built in the 1960s. It was sort of a reverse bathtub, but uh, obviously not to keep the water in, to keep the water of the, uh, the rivers and the bay out. Um, and in the rebuilding process, um, a decision was made to actually protect um, about 80 feet um, uh, width of that original wall as an artifact. Uh, and for the original <clears throat> architects and sort of vision planners, the slurry wall was really a symbol. It was a very po potent symbol of the fabric of American democracy that had been attacked. Uh, it had been wounded, but it had, had held strong. So it's a, it's a very powerful space for people to visit. One of the challenges of, of running a place like this is staying current with the ongoing consequences of, of uh, these events. So how does a museum, you know, like ours, where about an event that continues to uh, unspool and have it uh, or be unfinished, you know, how do we stay uh, attentive to and dynamic in incorporating that? So we have special exhibitions, we have public programs, we have education curricula, and we have to stay, you know, current uh, because this event continues to um, show us it's not over yet. And one uh, very powerful thing people will experience on the outdoor memorial um, is that we had to pause in 2019 and consider a way we would be honoring and not just the 3,000 uh, people who were killed on 9-11 uh, and the survivors whose lives were very uh, forever changed, but how do we address uh, the second um, generation of illnesses and deaths that have come out of 9-11 because of exposures to the environmental catastrophe that 9-11 also was. So we rededicated the southwest quadrant of the Memorial Plaza. We call it the Memorial Glade. And we pay um, respect, uh, we respectfully uh, acknowledge there the thousands of people who have fallen ill and tragically uh, many of whom are now dead or, or struggling with serious health conditions. Obviously, you see, you know, many, many people throughout the year, obviously, around now, I'm probably an influx of people. But, you know, you see people from uh, across the world coming across the country coming and, and people who who were there. Talk about the reactions that that people have had, both those who, you know, maybe weren't even alive when, uh, you know, the the attacks happened and, and those who were who were there at the time, those who, who were survivors. Uh when we were developing the museum, we were conscious of the fact that we had to work very carefully with this sort of vast, diverse community. We call them stakeholders, you know, people that found themselves directly in the story, whether they were uh, survivors, you know, responders, lower Manhattan residents, uh, family members, bereaved, a member of the bereaved community, and, and, and so forth. And we had to make sure, to the best of our ability, that um, whatever we did rang true to their experience. However, at the same time, we were not developing this museum for the uh, people who lived through the event. We were, we were developing it for all who would come thereafter that had no lived experience of 9-11, who'd never been to New York to see the towers. Um, you know, for, for the people were actually uh, maybe as many as, you know, 40% of our visitors today that come uh, are too young to have a lived experience of 9-11 or they uh, were born after 9-11. They're coming with parents who have uh, barely a, a, a lived memory. So uh, whatever we did had to ring true both for those that experienced the day and all the uh, consequences of it and for those who didn't experience but would, would be coming to learn uh, pay their respects and ponder sort of the lessons that came out of 9-11. And I'd like to say that most of what we do at the 9-11 Museum is not through the lens of the day itself. It's through the lens of September 12th. What did we do about it? You know, how did we react? How did we 
find the gumption and 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 courage and um, compassion to and resilience to get up and move forward. Um, and so, you know, most most hopefully, when people come, they are going to find that, however awful the chemistry of the day is, that one of the great legacies of nine eleven is 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 the positive. Um, lessons and compassion and unity, however, you know, uh, short-lived it may have <laughs> seemed, uh, that came out of 9-11. You know, we, we are always better when we work together. Um, and I think that's one of the great feelings people will take away from it. Thank you for joining us on this special episode. And a sincere and heartfelt thanks to former NISDOT employees Mukesh Desai and Craig Rule, as well as to the chief curator of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York City, Jan Ramirez. We hope this serves as a tribute to the courage and dedication of those who served tirelessly in the face of unimaginable adversity and the relentless efforts by New York State Department of Transportation employees who restored order amid the chaos. If you've never been to the September 11th Memorial and Museum, we encourage you to visit. It's an incredibly powerful experience and honors those who perished as well as those whose lives were forever changed.